Welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Joining me today is Dr. Shivam Joshi, a nephrologist. Today, we are going to talk about kidney health. So let's get into it. So why don't you tell us what the kidneys do for those people who don't know? Yeah, the kidneys do a lot. Um, they are these uh, wonderful organs. They're about the size of a fist. We have two of them in our flank area and the back on both sides. And they, uh, they, they help uh, keep everything in line. They help uh, keep our sodium levels in check. They regulate all the electrolytes. Uh, they help us uh, with the amount of fluid in our body. Um, and we see all of that as urine and we, you know, we kind of take it for granted every time we go to the bathroom and urinate. Uh, but for people who have kidney problems and uh, can't do this or have failing kidneys, uh, all of this just accumulates in the body. So imagine if you couldn't urinate and all that urine just uh, sat in, in your body and, uh, you know, that wouldn't feel good. And uh, yeah, that's not good. No, that is definitely not good. And a lot of people have kidney disease in the United States. Can you tell us about what percentage or how many people are suffering from kidney disease in the United States? Yeah, like 16 or 17 percent of people have kidney disease. Uh, a good portion of them don't know they have kidney disease. Uh, but as you develop health problems like high blood pressure and diabetes, that percentage does increase. So for people that have high blood pressure, it's about one in five. And for people who have diabetes, it's, it goes up to one in three. Yeah, that's, that's really, really bad for diabetes. Um, is, you know, sometimes I've seen actually in, because I work um, somewhere where I see a lot of younger patients and, you know, they have um, an elevation in their creatinine. And is it ever okay to have an elevation in creatinine? Suppose you have uh, one of my... Um, one of the residents said that he was told by his physician that because he had, you know, a high body mass, uh, I mean, a high muscle mass, and because he was on a keto diet, it was okay for his creatinine to be elevated. Is it ever okay? I guess, you know, you couldn't explain what a creatinine is. It's something that we kind of use to measure kidney function, but is it ever okay for that to be high? Yeah, exactly. So, so Creatinine is this uh, blood test. It's a, it's a compound in the blood. We measure it. As that number goes higher, uh, that actually translates into a lower percent kidney function, which often shows up as a GFR or estimated GFR, which stands for glomerular filtration rate. And that roughly correlates to percent kidney function. Uh, and going back to your question, some people do have a high creatinine because they do have a lot of muscle, um, muscle mass, the amount of muscle you have in your body does affect that number. And uh, conversely, some people have a very low creatinine. Um, uh, and, and as you would expect, people who don't have a lot of muscle mass, uh, like older women, often have a very low creatinine. Uh, cirrhotics often have a very low creatinine because they don't have a lot of muscle mass. Um, so looking at that number, uh, alone can be misleading. So it's good to look at that eGFR number and see what number that's giving you. And sometimes that can be off because uh, you might have more muscle mass than expected. So if you're still in doubt, uh, a kidney doctor or even your primary care doctor can order another test called a, a cystatin C or cystatin C. And that test can also uh, uh, tell you what your GFR is, and then uh, um, that might be able to uh, give a, a better representation of your kidney function. How about supplements? Do supplements affect the creatinine? I mean, if some of these younger patients are taking a lot of supplements like creatine, is that something that would affect your creatinine? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, taking a ton of, of creatine will definitely get metabolized into creatinine. And that could affect kidney function. I've seen that before. Um, eating a lot of meat uh, can do that because that's, you know, muscle. It's not uh, your own muscle. It's uh, another uh, uh, being's muscle. And you ingest that and then you, you can develop, uh, you can increase your uh, creatinine that way. Uh, so, uh, you know, if in doubt, you know, you can uh, repeat the test without uh, having, eaten, uh, you know, a uh, uh, a T-bone steak or something like that, and uh, w without having uh, 
uh, you know, all that uh, creatine powder right before the blood test. And, uh, uh, and you may get a different result. Or like I said, you can do a cystatin C or you can even do a 24 hour urine collection to really be accurate. So do you recommend that people stay away from those supplements if they are increasing the creatinine? Can that do long-term damage to your kidney if you are on those supplements? Uh, the creatine supplement, I don't think will do long-term damage. Um, I think it just messes up how we assess for things. Um, it, uh, it, it just makes it harder for us to, to test. So if you're in that situation and if you're going in for tests and uh, maybe you've had kidney problems in the past or you have a little bit of kidney disease, probably not a good idea to take that supplement right before you'd be tested because then you're doctor will be confused and you may get more or less treatment depending on the result. Uh, but I think um, I haven't uh, read anything that uh, these supplements uh, cause harm. Again, it's, you know, it's not encouraged to take more supplements than you need, uh, you know, because you don't know really what's in there. These are not well-regulated. Um, there could be contaminants. Uh, but what I find frequently is people do a lot of protein yeah. and then that's really controversial with the protein, whether to do protein or not to do protein. Yeah, so I mean, are those protein supplements, could they be possibly harming the kidneys if they are from animal protein, for instance? Whey protein yeah. is very popular. Yeah, so there's some observational literature that suggests that eating more animal protein can be detrimental to the kidney. People have an increased risk uh, of developing kidney disease or kidney failure. Um, granted, you know, these aren't your ideal experimental trials. This is just looking at people and noting associations. But, uh, but that, that, whole, um, that whole question, does uh, eating a lot of protein in general uh, cause problems to the kidneys? Uh, you know, the, there's a lot of evidence for and against, and I've written papers on this and tweeted about this. Uh, but what we do know, um, or at least what we're fairly confident of, is that eating a lot of protein, if you already have kidney disease, um, is not a good idea. And actually, the guidelines uh, in our societies uh, recommend restricting uh, amount, amount of protein as being consumed uh, so that you're not overdoing. You don't want to take out the protein. So obviously, protein is important for health. You want to make sure you get enough protein so you're not uh, becoming malnourished, but you want to not overdo it. So the ideal amount is getting it right in the normal range, which is around you know, 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 grams per kilogram of ideal body weight. How about vegetable protein? Can people with kidney disease have vegetable protein? Does that seem to cause the same harm as animal protein? Vegetable protein is thought to actually be a little bit easier on the kidneys. Um, there's a couple of studies to suggest this, that vegetable protein uh, may be helpful for the kidneys. Um, and it may, it may cause uh, less... Uh, of a burden to the kidneys and they may have some added benefits uh, uh, for the kidney. Um, and uh, uh, people previously used to avoid vegetable proteins because of this concern with the potassium and phosphorus. But what we're learning now after having a few more decades of research, we're realizing that actually this may not really be as big an issue as we previously thought. We think actually these foods may not cause problems with phosphorus or potassium, and actually may be really he healthy and helpful for patients to eat. So how much, if you already have a little bit of kidney disease, how much would you, how would you gauge how much of that, you know, plants and plant foods can you have if you're already kind of afraid that you might have too much phosphorus or potassium in your diet? How would you gauge that? Yeah, so if you already have kidney disease, um, it's uh, it can be a little tricky because there's a, a few things that you have to monitor. But um, uh, so uh, for all patients with kidney disease, I recommend seeing a dietitian um, who's skilled, or specifically a renal dietitian or a dietitian that manages kidney disease to help guide you in the situation. Um, uh, but what I tell my patients is I tell them to eat a healthy plant-based diet to make, to incorporate a lot of healthy fruits and vegetables, cut out the processed fast food, fried food, added sugars, uh, sodas, things like that. Uh, because those healthy foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, uh, legumes, nuts, and seeds really are some of the healthiest foods on the planet. And, uh, you know, people who have health problems need to be eating those foods so they don't develop more health problems. 
I mean, uh, can you explain um, the concept of hyperfiltration and how, you know, the protein is related to hyperfiltration and the kidney, the way the kidney works? Yeah, so people think that there might be um, a, uh, uh, a, a benefit to this, uh, like there, there's a reason why this hyperfiltration process happens. So hyperfiltration means you have more blood being filtered by the kidney. It, it's kind of, it's a sounds, it, it's, it's, it is what it sounds like. Um, and this happens in certain states. So when women become pregnant, hyperfiltration is happening because there's more blood flowing in the body. Um, uh, this also happens uh, when people eat more protein. Um, and the reason for this is that protein, uh, uh, some of those metabolites uh, need to be excreted in the urine. Uh, so the way that this is done to prevent it from accumulating in the blood is that um, the kidneys uh, receive more blood during that period of time. And uh, those toxins are ultimately filtered out. Those metabolites come out in the urine. Um, this also happens in... Uh, pathologic states like diabetes. So there's hyperfiltration happening in diabetes. Um, this can also happen in certain uh, kidney disease states. So as sort of portions of the kidneys uh, uh, start to decline in kidney function or some parts of the kidney stop working, the other parts of the kidney kind of pick up the slack. So uh, a good example is when someone donates a kidney or loses a kidney, the other kidney picks up the, the remaining work and it goes into this hyperfiltration state. This can be bad if uh, the kidneys are already struggling. So if the kidneys are already struggling and they go into this hyperfiltration state, um, it's kind of like making a, um, a car that, you know, really is kind of old and beat up. You know, it's putting it like on a Daytona 500. You know, it's, it's not a good setup. You know, after a while, it's going to start to, to burn out. And that's kind of what happens um, in kidneys that are, aren't working so well. Uh, when people uh, 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 do things that uh, tax or, or even uh, without uh, their intention, it just happens normally. So could you maybe decrease the protein in your diet to kind of decrease, you know, the amount that the kidney needs to filter? Would that make less impact on your kidney, theoretically? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we frequently tell our patients to avoid eating too much protein. So the idea is not to restrict protein entirely or to cut protein out because like I said earlier, you need protein for survival. But the idea is to avoid uh, overdoing the protein. So you don't want to eat uh, protein, protein, protein. So what we say is 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, somewhere in that area. You don't want to be eating two grams of protein per day. That's, uh, you know, two grams per kilogram, I should say. That's just too much uh, protein. Uh, and that could put your kidney into trouble. That, that, all that protein causes hyperfiltration. And yeah. the idea is, and some of the medications we give to treat people who have kidney disease is actually to undo the hyperfiltration. Uh, so um, what would you say, have you ever seen somebody go on a plant-based diet or any kind of diet and be able to reverse or kind of slow down at least their kidney disease? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I have seen uh, people go on plant-based diets. Uh, uh, there are definitely stories. I mean, you could even go with some people have had a remarkable response with plant-based diets. Um, other folks um, have gone on plant-based diets and have slowed down the progression of the kidney disease. Other folks have uh, had improvements in their diabetes or high blood pressure. Um, that uh, has, was contributing to the kidney disease and they've been able to improve these uh, other health problems that were affecting the kidneys. Uh, other folks have had uh, improvements in some of the complications of kidney disease and thereby have been able to take less medications like uh, less sodium bicarbonate to neutralize the acid in the diet, less phosphate binders. Uh, so I've seen um, a, a lot of uh, results with this. That's great. I mean, what if you already have kidney failure and you're on dialysis? Is it worth it for these people to go on a plant-based diet, would you say? Like, suppose you're already getting peritoneal dialysis or, you know, hemodialysis. Yeah, I think it's still worth it for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
we we recently wrote a paper on this and the potential benefits of uh, folks eating a plant-based diet while on dialysis. And, um, you know, the, there's the fiber aspect. A lot of people on dialysis have constipation, more than 50% of people. Uh, so the fiber can help with that. The fiber can help control with potassium levels. Um, it can help reduce blood pressure. It can help uh, reduce phosphate and acid levels. Um, and then the other thing is if you're on dialysis, um, uh, the healthier you are while on dialysis, the better it is because uh, if you ultimately apply for a kidney transplant or on the waiting list, in, in theory, everyone that's on dialysis should be evaluated for a uh, kidney transplant. So potentially all these people, uh, you know, the healthier you are, the better, the better it could ultimately be for when um, you go on uh, and get a transplant. Yeah, that's a good point. And I mean, also just being on a plant-based diet decreases your risk of so much, so many other diseases, you know, um, diabetes, you know, heart disease, of course. So that's definitely a good point. Now, um, I'm going to shift gears and start uh, asking you about uh, kidney stones, because a lot of people, they don't necessarily have kidney failure, but they suffer from kidney stones. So, um, you know, the most common kind of stone is a calcium stone, calcium oxalate stones. Um, and uh, what can people do to kind of decrease their recurrence of having a stone if they've already had one? Or if they don't want to ever get stones, I guess, what can they do with their diet? Yeah, so kidney stones are pretty common. Um, people get them. As you mentioned, the most common one is calcium oxalate. And a lot of my patients think that because they had a calcium oxalate stone, they need to cut back on the calcium. And uh, for most people, that's actually not true. And there's been studies on this. And we've... Uh, 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 we've talked about this, uh, in a couple of presentations and, uh, uh, and we're working on a paper at the moment on it. Um, but at any rate, the, the main things to, um, uh, to remember and anyone that has had a calcium oxalate stone is to one, drink more water. Water, um, helps dilute the urine, uh, concentrated urine helps form crystals and stones. So drinking more water turns that, uh, you know, those potential crystals and uh, precursors to stone formation uh, into uh, 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 more uh, soluble compounds that prevents their aggregation. So water is important. I counsel patients to get at least two liters. So in order to get two liters, you should be drinking two and a half, maybe even three liters of water per day. And it's helpful to carry a little reusable water container with you. You can fill up at work, at home, on the go, um, and that, and you know, you can keep track how many, you know, times have you filled it up throughout the day, and that kind of helps to go. So that's number one. Number two is to cut back on salt. Salt. Uh, the more salt you eat, the more salt you smell a your pee out in your urine, and uh, for reasons that we don't fully understand. Um, for every time you pee out salt, you're actually peeing out calcium and you don't want calcium in your urine because calcium is a uh, important uh, uh, element ultimately used uh, to form calcium-based stones. So you don't want calcium in, in your urine. And the way to do that is to reduce the amount of sodium uh, that you're taking in your diet. Um, and a lot of people don't know that. The third thing is animal protein. Animal protein acidifies the urine and promotes stone formation. Uh, specifically calcium oxalate stone formation. So it's been recommended uh, time and time again to actually avoid all animal protein. Uh, this includes red meat, chicken, fish, seafood, pork, um, eggs, all these proteins that come from animal-based sources acidify the urine, help promote stone formation. So I tell patients all the time to uh, reduce their animal protein intake, actually get plant protein intake, which actually alkalinizes the urine. We think of alkaline water, but actually plant foods are alkaline foods. They're uh, even better than alkaline water. Um, and then, and then uh, uh, eating a lot of fruits and vegetables can help neutralize uh, some of the stones that are being formed. It can help prevent stones. Uh, so there are, those are the big things. And for this is just not necessarily for kidney um, stone patients, but how much fluid would you recommend somebody get per day? Because I know there's some crazy diets now that they're recommending, you know, people have like a, a lot of water, which probably is not harmful. I'm supposing if you're, you know, your body can filter that water and everything, but 
Um, how much do you recommend, like, you know, uh, like, is it two, is it how, how much you weigh, you know, in ounces that you get, or what is your recommendation for people yeah. to maintain their kidney health, you know? Yeah, so you definitely want to drink to thirst unless you have heart, uh, chronic heart, liver, kidney issues. Um, you know, the adage is, you know, to have eight glasses of water a day. Uh, I think that was later uh, not found to really be evidence-based, but, um, you know, the idea is to drink to thirst, uh, make sure your urine is not getting too concentrated because that could lead to forming a stone. So you want your urine to be on, you know, light yellow, kind of like a light lemonade uh, to on the clearer side, unless you have a pre-existing health problem or unless your doctor has told you otherwise. But most people should drink um, specifically water and not something else that's actually probably uh, a, a, an equally important point is what people are drinking. And then when you do drink uh, water, try to not uh, try to avoid getting too thirsty. Yeah. And uh, just skipping <clears throat> back to the topic again of the uh, stones, um, I did have a patient that had been on a plant-based diet for a long time and, you know, was very healthy otherwise, but he kept getting the calcium oxalate stones because, you know, a lot of the leafy green vegetables have them. So is there anything you would recommend for those patients that are already on a plant-based diet, they're eating pretty healthy and they just don't know what else they can do? Um, I mean, I know there's a, a vegetable like borac that's supposed to be quite nice. You can grow in your garden, but not everybody has the resources, right? So I don't know if you have any extra recommendations for those kind of people. Yeah, so some high oxalate containing foods can cause problems in some people. Um, there's uh, this oxalate issue is, uh, is a big topic and probably uh, bigger, more complex than we have time for. But if you, if, if uh, so first, if, uh, if, you know, it's always important to know uh, that you are someone that is being affected by this. So the only way to know this is to do a 24 hour urine collection to know how much oxalate truly is in your urine. And if you are one of those few people that have a lot of oxalate in your urine, uh, you definitely want to see a kidney doctor. There are some ways to reduce the oxalate. I have uh, done this with some of my own patients. Um, some great ways to do this are to cut back on eating um, high oxalate containing plant foods. So uh, this includes some nuts and seeds, chocolate, rhubarb, star fruit, uh, cashews, uh, these types of things you kind of want to avoid. They're really high. There's lists of <laughs> oxalate, yeah, um, high oxalate foods. And then uh, you can also try to eat calcium containing foods um, at the same time, or some people even need a calcium supplement. Uh, antibiotic exposure, believe it or not, can increase oxalate uh, absorption. So there's a whole, a lot of, a bunch of things that go into it. But if you fall into this category, definitely see a kidney doctor. Yeah. I mean, um, another thing, this is an, another question. Um, if somebody has kidney disease and they're trying the plant-based diet uh, and they're losing a lot of weight, is there something you could recommend for those people? Yeah, yeah. So, so if if you are, uh, regardless of if you have kidney disease or not, and you are on a plant-based diet and you are losing weight, uh, uh, always a good, you know, it doesn't hurt to see a dietitian. Um, but uh, uh, if you're unable to, uh, don't have access, um, some ways to increase your calories uh, is, uh, you know, eating more food. That's, uh, that's fairly intuitive. Uh, but one way to do that is to actually eat more, more food that is higher in calories. So a, a good way to do that is nuts and seeds, uh, peanut butter, tahini, almond butter. Uh, these things are high in calories. Some people eat plant-based, eat a lot of um, raw or un, uh, completely unprocessed food. Eating a slightly more processed food than a complete raw will help you gain more calories. Um, um, and then uh, smoothies. Smoothies are a great way to add calories to your day People in that category. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're going to have to wrap it up soon. So I just want to... Um, let you have the opportunity to tell our listeners um, where they can find you if they, you know, want to get in touch with you or they're interested in what you have to say. Um, I know you have a nice blog, so if you can 
let them know about your blog and your website. And I don't know, Eric, if you're able to show the website that I put on the form. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if uh, if anyone out there um, has questions, you're more welcome to email me. My email is on my website. I'm on Instagram and Twitter, S Joshi M D. That's S J O S H I M D uh, for both of those Instagram and Twitter. Um, I'm more active on Twitter, I'll say. And then my website is afternoonrounds.com. I have a whole webpage on resources. Uh, links to free papers. I have lists of dietitians. I have videos um, of lectures. I have a lot of resources uh, for patients for anyone interested. Thank you so much, Dr. Joshi. So um, we're out of time. We're going to wrap it up now. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. This is Healthy Planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. We've been talking to Dr. Shivam Joshi, nephrologist. Thanks to all of you for being here. And thanks to Eric, our broadcast engineer, and the rest of the crew at Think Tech for hosting our show. And thanks to you, our listeners, for listening. I'll see you on June 9th for more of Healthy Planet on Think Tech, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet. Our next show will be about coral health with coral biologist Wendy Cover. If you have ideas for the show, please contact me at healthyplanetthinktech at gmail.com. Check out my website at gracenhawaii.com for more information on my projects and future show guests. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.